Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let the church say, Hallelujah. I welcome you on behalf of First United Methodist Church here to Common Ground, a place for all God's children. And on this Mother's Sunday, uh, Mother's Day, but it's also the fifth Sunday of Easter. Uh, Easter is a season of 50 days in which we continue to celebrate uh, and explore uh, the reality, the life that Christ has opened to us through his life, death, and resurrection. So I welcome you here to Common Ground. This is a pre-recorded service, and um, uh, so we're going to be taking you to different places around the campus, and uh, both Mark and Amy and myself. So, um, so come along and join us. A lot of people are asking, when will we, uh, when will we relaunch our uh, worship services, worship gathering? We're going to uh, uh, launch uh, one service, an outdoor worship service in our um, outdoor worship circle. Uh, in the meantime, we are making preparations uh, for that um, happening so that you can continue to uh, tune in by live stream if that's uh, most appropriate for you and your family or you can pull up in your car and tune in on the radio, uh, or you could bring your own chair and sit out in the lawn, or sit in one of our um, chairs that are spaced out uh, at least six feet apart there around the worship circle. Uh, we wanna, the beauty of Common Ground is we can accommodate uh, people uh, of various uh, comfort levels and particular needs. I want to start out our service with a question. I often ask this on Mother's Day. What one word would you use to describe your mother? What one word would you use to describe your mother? So for our prayer time, we, I thought I'd bring you down here to the, to the waterfall where Le, Larry Mull said was the holy of holies here on Common Ground. He said, just listening to this waterfall will heal any ailment you have, physically, mentally, emotionally, no worries. 
So I wanted to share a prayer from St. Anselm of Canterbury. He lived in the early 1100s AD and he wrote this. And you, Jesus, are you not also a mother? Are you not the mother who like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? For longing to bear children into life, you tasted the labor of death. And by dying, you gave birth to them, to us. So you, Lord God, are the great mother. And you, my soul, dead in yourself, run under the wings of Jesus, your mother, and lament your griefs under his feathers. Ask that your wounds may be healed and that comforted you may live again. Christ, my mother, you gather your chicks under your outstretched wings. This dead chick of yours puts himself under your wings. For by your gentleness, the badly frightened are comforted. By your sweet fragrance, the despairing are revived. By your warmth, you give life to the dead. And by your touch, you set sinners, make them right with God. To you be blessings for ages upon ages. Amen. Psalm 91 says this, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. God will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. So let me give you a moment to find refuge beneath the wings of God. prayer is adapted from the prayer by June Mears Drager. Mothering God, you are our mother and we are your children. We have no other gods before you. You pronounced our name and you called us into existence, breathing your very own breath, the breath of life into us. Like a baby in the womb of its mother, it is in you that we live and breathe and have our being. You are our mother, our father, our creator, and our sustainer, our beginning and our end. And so we come to you today to take shelter in the refuge of your wings.
Beneath your wings we bring with us those who carried and bore us into life. We bring our mothers and their mothers before them. Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, in addition to our biological mothers, we also bring those who have mothered us throughout our life through their nurture, guidance, and comfort. Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, we bring those who are unable to have children for whatever reason. We share their sorrow and we pray with them, Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, we bring those who did not know their mothers or who have lost their mothers. We grieve with them and pray, Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, we bring those whose mothers have failed to be the mother they needed. We sigh with them and pray, Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, we bring all those who are separated from their children for whatever reason, especially in the season of social distancing. Stir us to reach out toward them today, that they not be alone on this Mother's Day. And we pray with them, Lord, have mercy. Beneath your wings, we bring our Mother Earth and our Mother Land which are gifts of your care, but are suffering from us, your children, and our selfish carelessness. With all creation we cry, Lord, have mercy. Beneath the shelter of your wings, we gather this world as she groans beneath the ravages of a no novel coronavirus. Lord, gather the world's healthcare workers and scientists into your present work of bringing healing, complete and ultimate healing of all our diseases. And redeem our life from the pit that we have made, Lord and usher us into your way, into your truth, and into your life which is eternal and abundant, here and now and forever. Lord, have mercy. Mother in God, these are our prayers, the prayers of your beloved daughters and sons who have learned from your Son to boldly pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thursday, um, me and Ari here. Um, we're going to sing a song for you. It wasn't the song that I had originally hoped to sing. I wrote a song a couple of years ago, um, you mean and like I had five or six years ago, something like that, when my kids were small. So I needed to recruit some other small children. But since we're all quarantined, it didn't work very well, and the technology is a little difficult. So um, I thought about my own personal struggles as a mother, and 
instead of singing a sweet feel-good mother song, which is good, um, I thought I would write one that's more of a prayer, a confession, the things that we regularly struggle with as moms, or at least me, and I'm thinking maybe I'm human. But, um, so, <laughs> so, happy Mother's Day for me and Ari. We hope you enjoy.
So I want to thank everybody for uh, your generous support of our ministry here on Common Ground. Um, our ministry spans from our food pantry in which we are distributing food to uh, persons who suddenly find themselves in need, um, who um, have been employed up until this, this present crisis. Uh, so your giving helps to, to support that. Um, but also your giving helps to keep this campus open and available to our neighbors to find refuge here in this unique time in which uh, a church like ours can provide sacred space for people to, uh, to get out of their homes, to, uh, to get some exercise, um, but also just to, to breathe um, and to rest in God on this sacred ground. Um, that's just a couple of our, our ministries that are uh, the touching the needs of our community in this particular season. Uh, but there are many other ministries that we, you, you do. So, but thank you for your generosity and uh, continue to ask that you would uh, sustain that. Uh, you can give online at our website, fumcstanley.org. You can also um, mail your checks here to the office or drop them off in the mailbox. Um, or you can also, some of our members have gone to direct pay from their, uh, from their bank account. Whatever works best for you, um, let us know how we can, we can help you uh, arrange that. I'm going to be reading the scripture for you uh, from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. But from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The Word of God for the people of God. All right, well, thank you, Amy, for reading those scriptures for us. Uh, the scriptures there, they were uh, from John chapter 14. Um, some of the most uh, famous, some of the most beautiful passages uh, words in all of Scripture, uh, starting out with that, let not your hearts be troubled. Um, so, but in order to understand it, I think we need to put it in its context. So I'm going to go through uh, John chapter, start in John chapter 1, and we're going to work our way through uh, the Gospel of John up until that point, and do a little bit of storytelling about some of the stories that are in there. And then um, we'll kind of, when we get back to John 14, we'll settle in and we'll talk about those scriptures uh, a little more in detail. Uh, 
Um, so our first uh, scripture here is John chapter 1, verse 29. And in this part, uh, Jesus is just starting to step on the scene. Uh, John the Baptist is already out there. Some have wondered if he's the Messiah. He's told them plainly that he is not the Messiah. Uh, but that he is preparing the way for the Messiah. Now remember Jerusalem, uh, or the Jews, it, all of Israel is expecting a Messiah to come. And they've got their ideas. Now this is important. They've got their idea of a Messiah as this man that would come in and uh, be a political military leader and would remove uh, Rome from the throne uh, and put Israel back as the, the high point in the world. And Israel would from there rule the world. And that's their idea of a Messiah that would come in. Uh, he would be a great military leader. Uh, he would be one who would uh, take political power. He'd become essentially the next Caesar, except for a godly Caesar, and put Israel back where they were supposed to be as God's chosen people. So uh, John says, uh, he calls out, uh, this is the one that he's pointing towards, right? And so in verse 29, he says in John 1, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, um, if you were thinking about a military leader, somebody coming in ready to, uh, uh, to, to storm Rome and, and put you back on top, you probably wouldn't be looking for a lamb. Uh, you'd probably be looking for something more like the Lion of Judah, not the Lamb of God. Um, and so that's just some some curious phrasing there I'm sure that got people's attention um, and and we see just in that next phrase I, I want that I want you to stay with that next phrase for a minute keep the idea of the Lamb of God there okay uh, not the Lion of Judah he is the Lion of Judah um, but John when he's publicly endorsing endorsing him he calls him the Lamb of God and he says who takes away the sin of the world Right? He didn't say uh, who takes uh, away power from Rome or you know anything that people would generally be expecting from the Lamb of God. But of course, you know, sin is an issue and Israel knows that. So that's not, it's not too odd. Uh, but, but keep those two thoughts in your mind. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right. All right. So Jesus... Uh, if you fast forward just a little bit, he ends up, he's got some disciples now, but he's not publicly known yet. Even though John has publicly endorsed him, he hasn't really done anything to uh, get anybody's attention yet. And so he goes to a, a wedding. He's there with his mother and his family and his disciples go with him. And apparently this is a friend of the family and they're at the wedding. And you guys know the story. They run out of wine, uh, which was not just some arbitrary little, oh, they don't have alcohol um but it this would have been a really big deal for this family socially they would have been stigmatized probably in a way that they wouldn't recover from uh in the community at any rate and so uh but understand jesus has worked out with his father the timing of his revealing himself socially right i mean like from all eternity they have worked out the timing when jesus would step on the stage of human history and reveal himself publicly to the world and uh but mary has a request his mom has a request and she comes to him and says they're out of wine and, and his response is you know that that really doesn't have anything to do with me um it's it's not my time you know mary it's obvious mary has experienced jesus's glory behind uh off of the public scene and she knows that he can do something about this situation uh, but it's very interesting in this situation. Do you think Jesus was right or do you think Mary was right? Probably Jesus. Yeah. You know, Jesus is the one that existed before the world existed and uh, before the world had came into existence. And he had worked this out with his father. Uh, but it's very interesting. Jesus did not. He did not uh, stay with that idea that things had to be his way even though if anybody should get their way it would be Jesus because his way is perfect right but he submits to his mother now the Lamb of God right submitting to his mother in this case now understand Jesus isn't 12 he's 30 years old probably right yet he submits to his mother 
and he changes the timing for when he's going to reveal himself publicly and he does this thing and and if you read the rest of John to uh, lots of things start happening things move quickly word gets out he does some miracles and it says a lot of people were believing in his name, which you think, yes, that's what we're looking for. But there's a very curious phrase that Jesus uses at the end of John, uh, at the end of John 2, starting in verse 23. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people he needed no witness no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man so what is it that's in man that jesus is concerned about entrusting in himself okay so this is this is the point to the whole deal okay all right of course the thing that's in man that jesus wouldn't entrust himself to we all know as sin Remember, the Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. Sin is, we, we've said before that sin is a system of life that is organized around me, organized around myself and my desires and what I want. Another way of putting it is uh, it's self-will. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having a will. God created us that way. But self-will is when my will, I, I meant for my, I mean for my will to reign supreme. Right, and so uh, what I want is what I should get. And another word for that's pride. Uh, that was the whole the whole system of sin started back in the garden when uh, Satan tempted Adam and Eve to be like God, to reach up in pride and become like God and exert their self will, not be under the will of God, but be their own God, so that they could have self will so they could they could run things themselves and all of humanity all of the sin that's come has arisen out of that place of self will that's that place of pride it comes out in different ways in different people i mean if you're a type a personality self will might come out in the sense that uh that you dominate people that you run over people that you go and get what you want and you don't worry about who you hurt or it might be about rising in power rising in status um, for for that kind of person or, or for you self-will may be uh, or for another it may be uh, with uh, yeah, using people for your own gratification uh, often that's through uh, through uh, sex or through lust and things like that it may come out and you manipulating people in order to make your life work you use your words to de deceive and uh, to manipulate people into getting what you want um, it can come out in vanity, trying to look good, whether that be physically um, or uh, just pouring all your life into how you look to other people, whether it's physically or in, in social status. Or There's just countless, countless ways that this self-will, uh, it, it rears its ugly head. And so Jesus understood that the, that the world was looking for a Messiah. And they were looking for a military leader, as we said, who would come in with and give them political power back. But see, here's the trouble with that. When self-will dominates, it doesn't matter who's in power, sin will still reign. I want to say that again. When self-will, when pride dominates, it doesn't matter who is in power, sin will still reign. So if Jesus entrusted himself to man when they were still caught up in this life of self-will, they would try to make him into a Messiah that put Israel above Rome, which Israel's is God's chosen people. So you say, well, what would be wrong with that? Well, if he does it on the premise of self-will, where self-will still reigns, then it doesn't matter if it's Rome and it, or, or if it's Israel or whoever it is, it doesn't matter if it's the Republicans or if it's the Democrats. It doesn't matter if it's this nation or that nation or this religion or that religion. It doesn't even matter if it's Christianity because when self-will dominates, sin will reign. And Jesus didn't come to put Rome out of power, but he came to take away the sin of the world. Christianity has had points in history 
in which they were in charge and those are some of the darkest places in all of human history because they because the reign was one of self-will and so that's Jesus's agenda here is not political politics always play in because it's a part of our world but the underlying thing Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so he will not submit to that system because that's not his agenda but you got to understand, people are starting to get ideas about him. He's turned water into wine. He's done some miracles. People are saying, hmm, maybe this is the guy. He's gathered 12 disciples, right? He's going to be the leader of the world as Israel. That's what they're thinking. He's got 12 disciples. There's 12 tribes of Israel. Those disciples are thinking that they're going to be the ones that rule on those thrones. Remember, James and John's mother comes and says, Hey, can my sons, my two sons, James and John, can they sit on your right and your left when you enter your kingdom? So that's, she's thinking political kingdom. What were the disciples always arguing about? Who was the greatest? That wasn't just egotistical, like I'm better than you. No, no, that was who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand in his kingdom. That's what that was about. Because they're still thinking in a self-will dominated political power in which they are going to exalt themselves. And even his own disciples missed it all along. There's something else they missed too. He's the Lamb of God. And the scriptures say that he's told them, he told them over and over again, I'm going to a cross and they never heard it they never heard it because they were looking at him as the Messiah through self-will through pride All right so fast forward just a little bit further we get over into John uh, 5 or 6 I've got it here yes in John chapter 6 uh, Jesus uh, he gets out he's gathered a big crowd of people 25,000 or 15 to 20,000 people uh, 5,000 men plus women and children they're gathered out they're listening to him teach now imagine a man that could turn water into wine that can gather that many people around him right it's a big deal and so uh, uh, David when he was coming into his kingdom back with him and Saul he had 400 people gathered around him uh, and that ultimately with God was enough and so here Jesus has this many people right and now they need food and so Jesus takes a little boy's lunch a couple of fish a little bit of bread feeds all those people with it Wow okay so not only can he power is he powerful enough to turn water into wine and gather that many people but just think of the logistics of, of being able to feed an army out on the battlefield and only just take a bag lunch one bag lunch and you can feed the army for as long as the battle takes it'd be a huge military advantage not to mention the kind of power that exists in somebody that could do that so what do they do? Well, there at the end of John 6, it says uh, in verse 15, that's not the end, but at, after that story, it says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and make him, uh, to take him by force, to make him king, Jesus withdrew to the mountain by himself. They were going to come and make him king because they said, Yes, we have got our guy. Rome, look out. And, I mean, you can't blame them. I, I saw a book out, you know, it came out a little while back. It said, Jesus for president. I'd vote for Jesus for president. If you're going to have a king, it should be Jesus, right? But here, once again, he cannot submit to their idea of what a king. He is a king. He tells Pilate that later. I am a king. But my kingdom's not of this world. Because if it were, my followers would would be fighting my servants would be fighting for me he wasn't just talking about the disciples he's talking about the angels that he had connection with Rome would lose that fight I promise you but Jesus's kingdom was not one of self-will that needed political power in order to pull off self-will you see, that's the key. They're, they're thinking Jesus with somebody with so much power, he would be the person in a world of self-will. The more power you have, the better off you are because you can actually have your will accomplished. People listen to you. People uh, dote on you. People submit to you out of fear or out of just pride. And, and, and you, you, you're the person that can get what you want. And they're not understanding why Jesus wouldn't want to do this. But he refuses to step into this with them. Fast forward just a little bit further, and I know we're moving quickly. 
uh, but you get to Lazarus. Lazarus is a good buddy of Jesus's, and Lazarus uh, has died. Jesus loves Lazarus. And he shows up um, four days afterwards. You know, this is a big deal. People, Jesus has raised people from the dead before. But everybody knew Lazarus. Everybody knew he was dead. He's just right out. He's in Bethany. It's really close to Jerusalem. Uh, it's very public. People have come out to help mourn. And Jesus raises him from the dead. <clears throat> now let's think about the implications of a man who can turn water into wine. <coughs> a man who can feed that many people, gather that many people, and then feed them with just a little bit of food. And he can even, even raise his enemies from their dead from the dead it'd be hard to win a battle against a military leader who kept raising his people from the dead every time you killed them I believe if I were on the battlefield and I were fighting Peter and I killed Peter and I turned around and fought somebody else and turned back around to find Peter standing there fighting me again I believe I'd be inclined to switch sides <laughs> So, of course, everybody's thinking this is the guy. And he goes in the triumphal entry, in, entry into Jerusalem, right? And they're throwing their, down their palm branches. They're waving them. They're saying, Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going, yes, we got this. But remember, he's the Lamb of God. There's an interesting exchange, and everybody's heard this before, but Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, who are people saying that I am? And they give their answers. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. And Jesus, you know, Pat Simon on the back, says, God revealed that to you. That's awesome. And then he goes on to talk about how he's going to a cross. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. You can't blame Peter because th that's not, th it, it's the wrong messiahs. It's the false messiahs that ended up crucified. We just said that you're the real messiah. You're the one with the power. You're the one that should be exerting your will and getting what you want. Why would you be submitting to death when you can do whatever? There's no way they could take your life, your life from you, Jesus. You are too powerful. And Jesus says to him, and the famous part is, get behind me, Satan. And we always remember that. But the next part is very instructive. He says, you have in mind the things of man, the things of self-will, of pride, of getting what you want but not the things of God <clears throat> see the things of God are their love their humility they're actually laying down your will for God's will which is for the good of others you see, if there is, <coughs> we talk about Christians need to stand up for their rights. Understand that Jesus is right. He was the only one that had a right not to die. The wages of sin are death, and all of us fall under that, but not Jesus. He is the one person that has walked the face of the earth that had a right not to die. He surrendered that right for you. And he was going to a cross because his is not the way he does not rule through self-will but his rule his kingdom is a kingdom of love it's a kingdom of humility it's a kingdom of considering others more significant than yourself it's a kingdom that lays down self-will ultimately that's what the cross is and you say, well, thank you, Jesus. I'm glad you did that. Now my life is going to be great. And it really will be. But he says, but you, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. And so our natural response is, well, that's just going to destroy my life. <laughs> because our lives are built on self-will. And if I can't live for that, what, what in the world do I live for? 
But remember, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. Well, the disciples hadn't understood the finding it part yet. They just are realizing that they're losing their life. They left everything to follow him. And they had the idea that it was going to pay off. That it, who cares if you left the tax collector business? Who cares if you left the fishing business? If you're going to be able to go and uh, rule the whole world with Jesus. But now they realize that that's gone. They actually say, I, maybe I should just go and die with them. Let's just go and die with them. We've got nothing left. And then that's where those words come in in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's room for all of us. <clears throat> and I'm going to prepare that place for you. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas uh, speaks up. I believe it was Thomas. And he says, um, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And that's where those famous words come in. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so Philip says, just show us the Father and that's enough. And, and he's right. Because the Father is enough. And that's actually what Jesus is teaching. That the way of the cross, the way of laying down self-will, is a way that steps into a life that is in lockstep with the Father. And so he starts telling them. He says, he's saying, I'm, I've been in lockstep with the Father all along. Because I've lived this, I've laid aside self-will from the beginning and step by step in my life, I've been in step, I've been right in step with the Father. He says, don't you know that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? And believe that, or at least believe because of the works. He's saying, you, you remember when I did turn the water into wine? Or when I fed all those people with just a little bit of food? Or when I spoke and Lazarus come, came forth from the grave? See, that was because I was in lockstep with the Father. That when I live this life of submission of my will for God and for the good of others, when I do that, the Father steps right in there with me. And that is the abundant life. That's eternal life. That's where we find everything that we're looking for. The Father is enough. And then the best news of all, not only does Jesus call us to the life of laying down self-will, the life of the cross, but then he says, and you're going to do greater works than me because I'm going to the Father. Doesn't mean he's going to the Father like way a long way away, but he is stepping to the realm where the Father is, where the Father is. See, the Father was right there with Jesus. He was just invisible. And what we call the ascension later on after the resurrection is just Jesus stepping into the invisible spot where God is. He moves to the right hand of the Father. And when he does so, he takes us with him. When we live as his disciples, in his name, we connect with the Father. That now I am living in lockstep where I'm learning to live in lockstep with Jesus as I take up my cross. I am finding the exact same life that Jesus had in connection with the Father. So Paul says in Colossians 3, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's the same thing as Jesus is saying in John 14. He says, you'll do greater things because I'm going to the Father. Because now through Jesus, you can seek the things that are above where Christ is at the right hand of the Father. That's, that's how you do that. You that. That's what this eternal life is. I can, I can acknowledge the Lord in all of my ways. As Proverbs 3 says, that just remit, means remember that in the same way that the Father was always with Jesus, Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit are always right there with you. We don't have time to go through it, but the rest of John 14, Jesus lays out that the Spirit's with you, that I and my Father will come and make our home with you, and I will manifest myself to you. It's right there. Read the scriptures uh, and when this is over. But understand that when we acknowledge, we remember that the Father is right there with us, we also acknowledge the Lord, acknowledge that He's Lord. And that means primarily we just acknowledge that His way is perfect. 
that the way of laying aside self-will is the way that we step into this life. Let's go back to those famous words. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now we use those words a lot, but I heard Eugene Peterson say one time, he said, we make a lot about the truth and the life, but we often miss the way of Jesus. But actually those three things, they come in order. It's as I step into Jesus's way that I come to know the truth and find the life, the life, this eternal abundant life where I acknowledge the Lord and he steps with me in my life. But I start with the way of Jesus, the way of humility, the way that lays aside self-will and pride, the way of the cross. Remember Jesus said, if you abide in my words, my way, you're truly my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you read the next couple verses, you find out the freedom that he's talking about is freedom from sin. The Lamb of God, which is the Lamb is the one that has no self-will, but that has chosen the cross. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world and he does so by moving us into his way and through us stepping into his way he reveals to us his truth and brings to us his life and we're wondrously set free from this life of sin where self-will dominates we got a long way ago to go and it's a process but the good news is we don't have to be perfect before we step into the way and know the truth and find the life. We just have to choose it. It's for you and me. It's for right here and right now that you can step into Jesus' way, the way of humility, the way of considering others more significant than yourself, the way of laying aside your will for the sake of God, for His will, and for the good of others. When you do that, you step into his way in a powerful way. You find his truth and you come to live his life. Let us pray. Dearest Father, we are so grateful for your presence here with us. We're grateful for sunshine. We are grateful for uh, just the incredible gifts that you've given us in our lives. We have a lot of heartache, that's for sure. But the good far outweighs it. And even when it doesn't seem like it, you have an eternal glory prepared for each of us. We don't have to wait for that when we die, but we can step into it right now. And then on that day when we do take our last breath, we step into that glory in all of its fullness, far beyond anything that we've ever imagined possible. Burn that in our hearts. Give us that hope. We thank you and we love you. And we ask you for all this in Christ's name. Give us the courage to do it. Amen. Well, thank you guys. I'm going to turn you over to Amy and let her close this out with a song uh, that she wrote that goes uh, right in line with what we, we have learned here today, what we've talked about here today. Thank you guys so much and God bless. Hey guys, I'm going to play a song for you that I wrote um, that's based on a prayer um, that's actually based on a song by John Michael Talbot. Um, his, the prayer that I learned uh, through the North, North Umbria community is, Christ is a light, illumine and guide me. Christ is a shield, overshadow me. Christ over, Christ under, Christ on my left and on my right. And it goes on, and it's just a very comforting um, prayer to remember Christ being ever present with us no matter what we're going through what the situation is and so I hope that you will feel his arms surrounding you as you listen to the words of this song
Thank you, Pastor Mark, for that message, and Amy for uh, bringing the message in song. And I want to thank all of you for joining us on this Mother's Day in the midst of the Easter season. May you have a sense that the risen Christ is indeed risen and that he is walking with you here now. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings protecting hide you. Daily manna still provide you. God be with you till we meet again.